Good evening, good to uh, be in the house of the Lord this evening and thank you for making the effort to be here on uh, what is, was a quite warm day, but uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Psalm 71, Psalm number 71, as Pastor read uh, the entire psalm earlier, appreciate that, and uh, we're going to uh, be looking at this psalm in detail tonight, hopefully it won't take too long, uh, Darren Fiona uh, are busting to get to the airport soon, so if I go too long, they are, are going to just walk out. So <laughs> instead of just throw their hands in the air and walk out, it's not anything like that. This is working. It is working. It isn't working. I'll leave that there. Is that better? No? One, two, one, two. Can I talk? Okay. I'm just going to carry on. Okay, well, Psalm 71. Let's, uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Well, Father, we thank you for the opportunity tonight. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the testimony shared tonight. Thank you for Caleb leading and uh, Lord being willing to do so. And uh, we just thank you for uh, the opportunity now to open your word. And uh, we trust that uh, your Holy Spirit will... Uh, Lord, have opportunity to work in hearts tonight. May there be no resistance. And uh, simply, Lord, I just want to be a messenger tonight. I, Lord, want uh, people's eyes to be turned upon you. And uh, Lord, for you to do the work, I plead. And uh, so, Lord, we ask that this will be a, a time of nourishment as we feed on your word now and uh, a time where we could be built up in our faith and uh, ultimately where you'll be glorified through it all. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 71 is the psalm of an old man. Did you pick that up? Uh, he's an old man with many trials and problems, uh, but he's obviously a joyful man. I'm sure you picked that up as well in the reading. Uh, a joyful man who's able to put his focus on the Lord in the midst of the trials that he was, he was going through. And so the application of this psalm is, is somewhat simple, as it shows us to, to put it simply, do just that, to focus on the Lord in the midst of trials. Now, it's been said that God's way to grow old is to develop a walk with him now. Do you agree, Brother Eric? Well, I don't know why I called you out, but there you go. <laughs> God's way to grow old is to develop a walk with him now. So young people, what you do now is going to be key for how uh, you walk with the Lord when you get older. Um. But we see that the reason the psalmist could handle his problems so well as an old man was that he had developed, of course, a walk with God in the years leading up to this time. He had proven, uh, he had a proven resource, of course, uh, in the Lord, which enabled him to be strong uh, spiritually, even though his body was growing old and weak and his enemies were against him. Now, we don't know for sure who wrote Psalm 71. There's no title uh, for this psalm, at least not in my Bible, but uh, um, it does lean toward David uh, in the way that it's written. Some have said that uh, maybe David wrote this psalm at the time of Absalom's rebellion, um, and there are some similarities there, but we won't spend time laboring on that now. <laughs> you can maybe do that study and come to a conclusion yourself. Um, it doesn't really matter either way. Uh, but at any rate, there's a, a couple of qualities of uh, this godly man's walk with God, which um, he developed over the years that uh, I want us to look at tonight, because as I said before, they're key. Uh, as just as they were key at uh, the time of his trial, in his old age, they're key for us. And they're qualities, I, I guess, that we need to develop as well. The first, there's two, two qualities that I see here in this psalm. The first one, of course, is the need to develop a deep knowledge of God. And the second is the need to develop godly habits of trust and praise and hope. Now, the psalm, looking at uh, the need to develop a deep knowledge of God, we see here that this psalm is filled with a deep, personal understanding and practical knowledge of the Lord God. I hope that you pick that up. I'm not going to spend the time to read the psalm again because we're going to go through and pick out a lot of verses as we go through it. But... Um, this is this is key <laughs> to know and develop and to have a deep 
knowledge of God and it's and it's uh, very clear in this psalm that uh, the writer had this. He had a deep personal understanding and he had a practical knowledge of the Lord God. He'd obviously been taught of God even from his youth. If we looked in, uh, if we look at verse 17 uh, there of the Psalm 71, it says, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth and here, hitherto I have declared thy wondrous works. So God, thou hast taught me from my youth. The man knew God. Uh, he knew God as his refuge, his strong refuge. In verse 7, you can see, he, has, he says there, I, I am as I wonder, wonder, excuse me, I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong, my what? My strong refuge. Um, this man knew God as his refuge. He knew God as his righteous saviour. In verse 2, you can see that. Deliver me, he says. Deliver me. In thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and and save me. Uh, he calls God his uh, rock uh, of habitation, his rock and fortress there in verse 3, the very next verse. He says, Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Right, so... Uh, he goes on, he says, Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. And then in verse 5, he says that his God is his hope and confidence. Verse 5, For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust, uh, thou art my trust from my youth. Um, he goes on, he talks of God's mighty deeds in verse 16 of this psalm he says i will go in the strength of the lord god i will make mention of thy righteousness even of thine only his strength and his power he mentions in verse 18 where he says now also when i am old and gray-headed O god forsake me not until i have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come um he goes on about and mentions in verse 19 the great things that he has done. Uh, in verse 19, thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things, O God? Who is like unto thee? You might remember I read these verses this morning to open our service. And uh, your Bible there, I hope, has an exclamation mark after the word thee. It's not a question. It's a statement. <laughs> All right. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things? O God, who is like unto thee? There is none other, of course, uh, as he uh, proclaims. And so he realized that it was God who brought him into, uh, into trouble and God who delivered and uh, restored him. It's uh, there in verse 20. Thou uh, which has showed me great and sore troubles shalt quicken me again and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Um, you know, God was his source of comfort in this trial, the very next verse. All right, he says, thou, hast, thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. God has redeemed his soul. Verse 23, he says, My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee and my soul which thou hast redeemed. And as he exclaims, O God, who, who is like you, as we just pointed out there in verse 19 he, he could testify with his mouth uh, that he's sorry he could testify that his mouth was filled with God's praise and glory and righteousness all the day long and as we we read verse 22 but we read it again I also will praise thee with the psaltery even thy truth O my God under thee will I sing with the harp O thou holy one of Israel my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee and my soul which thou hast redeemed, my tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought under shame that seek my hurt. This man knew his God. Amen. Um, you know, just by looking at those few verses in in uh, in this psalm, he knew his God, and it was obvious that he had known him for years, and he had proved God's faithfulness in a number of previous difficult situations. So. Uh, in this instance, when he needs to trust God, it's not a matter of a, a, a blind leap of faith, uh, but no, 
Uh, he knew his God in a personal, in a practical, in a proven way, and it was key for him to get through uh, this time. Now, if we pause here and just make a, a point of challenge, uh, can I ask you tonight, do you know God like this man knows God? Do you know God like this man knows God? Are you, are you growing in the process of developing such knowledge through his word and through applying his word to your life? Are you growing? Are you allowing the word of God to renew your mind, to transform you? And is that having an impact on your life? Is that actually uh, giving you a foundation uh, to establish your faith and then put that faith into action, uh, such as was the case for the psalmist here? Do you know God in a personal, practical and proven way? Now, one of the most important things that each one of us can do to prepare for whatever crisis uh, we may have to face in the future is to be spending time now in God's Word, getting to know God and uh, asking ourselves if we, as we read God, praying beforehand, asking the Lord to help us. How does the passage, each passage that we read, uh, teach us about God, reveal God to us? And, uh, and then praying and seeking to ask the Lord to help us to apply it, that we then may what? We may grow in him. So the need to develop a deep knowledge of God. Are you feeding on God's word? Are you praying with a desire, with a hunger and thirst to get into God's word that he may be revealed to you in such a way that you develop a, 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 a deep knowledge of him? You know, we sing... Uh, various hymns with just that that plea, you know, over oh, deep love of Jesus and into the heart of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go. You know, reading the Word of God is not just flippantly reading it; it's 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 pausing, it's sila, you know, in the Psalms. Pause, stop, and consider, and pray, and ask the Lord to reveal Himself to you, so that over time, He may be revealed to you in such a way that it develops that deep knowledge of Him that becomes foundational for you to develop faith, that you can then put that faith, that trust into action that is par- uh, that then becomes paramount to getting you through the trials that you may come. And he will gain the glory for it. We'll see that very, very shortly. So the need to develop a deep knowledge of God. Secondly, the need to develop godly habits of trust, praise and hope. The need to develop godly habits of trust, praise and hope. The definition of of uh, of habit is uh, um, uh, is this I have one here. A habit is developed by frequent repetition over a period of time, and uh, once it is in place, a habit becomes almost involuntary. Right? A habit a habit is developed by frequent repetition over a period of time, and then once it is in place, a habit becomes almost involuntary. Now, here's a fact. Our attitudes of how we respond uh, mentally and emotionally to life's problems tend to become habitual responses. Some people become habitual warriors. Uh, Some people become habitual complainers. Some people become habitually negative, uh, pessimistic, angry, Uh, Others become habitually cheerful and positive. Uh, I have a quote here. It says, The habits we develop in our younger years tend to take us further in that direction as we grow older. I've put in my notes, Oh, no. (laughs) I'm in trouble. (laughs) You know, the habits that we develop in our younger years tend to take us further in that direction as we grow older. What the cause us to stop and to take stock, isn't it? What what are our habits? Notice back here in this psalm, though, the word continually repeated in verses 3, 6, and 14. You'll see it there in verse 3. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. In verse 6, um, uh, by my praise, uh, my praise shall be continually of thee. 
and then in 14. But I will hope continually. All right. So this tips us off to the habits of this of the psalmist and what he uh, the habits that he had developed. Um, they're not uh, they're not habits that we uh, that we pick up naturally. Uh, they must be deliberately cultivated. In fact, these habits stem from his knowledge in God. Okay, again, it gets it, that knowledge of God is key, isn't it? All right, and uh, the habits that he has uh, are from uh, stem from that knowledge of God. They're habits of trust uh, in verse three that we've read already. The habits of praise in uh, verse six, as uh, we have read already, and uh, their ha- habits of hope in verse 14 as we've read also now i want to go quickly just through these the habit of trust the habit of trust be thou in verse 3 be thou my strong habitation whereunto i may continually resort in fact the whole psalm is a declaration of the psalmist's trust in the lord All right he, he was struggling because he was in a difficult uh, circumstance with many seeking his life, but he was steadfast in his faith because he knew who or whom, my mother-in-law's not here, so I can get away with saying who, I um, <laughs> hope she's not listening, um, <laughs> because uh, he, he knew whom he believed. But such faith stems, as I said before, from a knowledge of God. All right, true knowledge, what does it dismiss? It dismisses doubt and fear. All right, we fear and mistrust that in which we don't know, whereas we're more inclined to trust that which we know well, assuming that it's trustworthy. Okay, you all sat in a chair tonight, and uh, we didn't think twice whether or not that chair would hold us up. Why? Because we trust it, and um, and um, and it always does hold us up. These the brand new chairs; they, there's no chairs busting out yet that are. You know, uh, no one's falling to the ground or anything like that. Um, but uh, it's because it's continually trustworthy. It's, it continually does what it's meant to do. And so uh, I think it was Billy Graham that said once, certainty leads to trust. Certainty uh, leads to trust. We go to the tap and we turn it on and there's water coming out. We expect water to come out of it. I, I don't know how many of us here you might have. All right. Uh, but I didn't today. I went to the tap several times to get a drink of water, and I knew as I turned on the tap, there'd be nice, clean water, such as here, um, you know, for us to drink. Certainty uh, leads leads to trust. Um, you know, what about a guy who will... Anyone been parachuting here? There's probably a couple that have. There we go. <laughs> Nathan, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, the first time you went parachuting, it's pretty nerve-wracking. I reckon I'd squeal like a sucking pig if I was up there at 10,000 feet, you know, jumping out. I haven't done it before, but but there are those who do it all the time and they might be anxious. You know, their, their heart rate may, may go up. I, I think it'd be silly if, they, if it didn't. But uh, because they've done it so often, uh, there's a, there's a somewhat of a trust in, in that uh, parachute. They, they know how to fold it. They know which cord to pull. And I often think of the Looney Tunes when he, you know, well... Coyote pulls the, the ripcord and the knives and forks fall out, and you know, but don't know that. No, anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, the parachutist has that sort of trust. Now, now it doesn't mean that we're never going to be not anxious or anything like that, but um, it certainly does lead to trust. Now, because the psalmist knew God, he had learned to trust God in times past, right? In verse 20, we, we see that where he says, Thou which has showed me great and sore troubles, shalt quicken me again, and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou which had showed me great and sore troubles. All right, so he he'd learned to trust God in times past, and he knew therefore that God would see him through in this present time. Again, what is key? Well, his knowledge of God, um, and it, it was tried and proven. It was consistent, and uh, it. God became certain to him, and that certainty led to a trust. Now, God, don't get me wrong here, God doesn't need to perform anything or shouldn't need to perform anything in our lives to for us to gain his trust. Our trust comes from faith, faith in the word of God, 
um, and um, trust in his promises, uh, trust that he is God, of course, and that leads us uh, to trust. But over time, God uh, will, um, uh, as this psalmist occurred with him, um, uh, God revealed to him that he was trustworthy and he learned to trust God in the times past and he knew, therefore, that God would see him through this present time. I'm asking tonight, are you developing a habit of trusting God in the difficult times of your life? Or are you frequently filled with worry, doubt and fear? See, if you have trouble trusting, then can I encourage you tonight to concentrate on getting to know God? Because remember what we said right at the start? That's key. And that might sound very basic, but in the busyness of our times or being brought up in a Christian family, we can very easily look over who God is. Now, let me tell you, if God is not having an impact on your life as revealed from the Word of God, then you are going to struggle to trust Him when things get tough, right? We need to have that solid foundation. We need to have that understanding which causes us to become steadfast, which causes us to build our faith and put that faith into action as we trust him, right? The Hebrews 11 type of faith. You know, the, the, the men and women of the word that, that are revealed there for us that trusted God. They didn't know the end game, they didn't know where the finish line was, but they trusted in faith because of their understanding of who God is. Do you have that uh, trust in God tonight? Are you developing a habit of trusting God in the difficult times of your life? In those difficult times, does it cause you to uh, be put on your knees? Does it cause you to get into the Word? Does it cause you... A sense to 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 uh, have a sense of calm in your heart, or do you allow the uncertainty to take over and allow that weapon that the devil uses so often, called worry, uh, doubt, and fear, to steal away the joy of your salvation, to steal away the certainty of His will for your life? I can also encourage you not only to get to know God, but to review what God has already done for you, right? That's that right focus. That was the right focus that this psalmist had that got him through even his old age in this um, time of trouble. You know, there's a tremendous emphasis in this psalm on what God has done. All right, look at verse 5 and verse 6. All right, for thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of him. Look at verse 15, uh, 16 and, so, and following. Uh, my mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and here, hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and grey-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed the strength unto this generation, thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to every one that is to come. Verse 19, thy righteousness also, O God, is very high, who hast done great things, O God, who is like unto thee. Um, verse 20, thou hast... And thou, which hast showed me great and sore troubles, shalt quicken me again and shalt bring me up again from the depths of earth. Um, and then verse 23, My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee and my soul, which thou hast redeemed. My tongue shall also talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for thou art confounded, and, and so forth. So, you know... <laughs> This, this strengthens faith. You know, has God ever saved you from your sins? Can I ask you? <laughs> I hope everyone here knows that he has. Um, has he sustained you this far? Then, then, of course, you can trust him presently and in the future. Let's just quickly turn back to Psalm 31. Psalm 31 is a psalm of trust as well. A psalm of trust and praise. Psalm 31. 
David here says, in thee, O Lord, do I put my what? My trust. Let me, let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear unto me. Uh, deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defence to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me. For thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O God of truth. I have hated them that have uh, that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul and adversities. All right, and that psalm continues uh, to go on, and uh, and again in verse fourteen he says, "But I trusted in thee, O Lord." I said, thou art my God, All right? And, and the Psalms are full of looking back to see what God has done for his people. Times of deliverance and times of praise and times where God has showed his mercy. What do we say mercy was? I use this uh, a few times lately, but mercy is giving sacrificially, giving unconditionally and at great cost. My friend, if you can't look back and see that God has bestowed his mercy upon you and that doesn't strengthen your faith and encourage you and build you up, then I'm not sure what will. God has given sacrificially. God has given unconditionally. God has given at a great cost that we might be saved from eternal damnation, that we might be delivered from the depths of hell, that we might be delivered from the hands of our enemies, that we might be delivered into eternal glory because of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming into this world and paying for our sins. It's, it's not hard to look back, is it? And as we do, to rejoice in what God has done for us. And that ought to build our trust in him that develops uh, a habitual trust, if you like, so that when the hard times do come, we don't flee into the shadows, we don't get full of despair, but that we trust in him and allow him and his will to be fulfilled in our lives. The habit of trust. Then there's the habit of praise. The habit of praise in verse 6. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. For thou art he that took me out of my mother's, mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. The habit of praise. Do you praise God continually? You know, praise is not a natural habit. Um, at least not for me. <laughs> I've got to let you in on a secret tonight. You probably already know this. I don't even know. I probably have to say it. But I'm a grumbler and a complainer by nature. There, I said it. It's on record. <laughs> I am. I'm a grumbler and a complainer by nature. You just ask my daughters. No comment? No, okay. But uh, <laughs> you know what? God wants us to be people of praise. He does. He wants us to be people of praise. Even when difficult times come, God wants us to learn to praise him. And the psalmist had deliberately developed this habit. All right, We may have read the verses already, but let's go over it again. In verse 8, we can see this. He says, Let my mouth be filled with what? Thy praise and with thy honour all the day. In verse 14 again, okay, he says, But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. In verses 22 through to 24, I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God, unto thee will I sing with the harp, O thy Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed, my tongue shall, uh, sorry, my tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long how can we learn to praise god when trials come well the answer of course is to learn to trust him because just as trust stems from knowing god so praise stems from trusting god do you see the the connection there know god develops a trust for god which then develops a praise for god now this is true on the human plane as well right um, it's you know you can't praise a person that you don't trust, and if you feel that there's uh, something about a person that you can't trust, you won't sing their praises to 
to others and it's the same way with God. If a deep down if deep down inside you doubt God's goodness or faithfulness for allowing some trial to come into your life, then it's quite possible you don't trust him. And not trusting him, you cannot honestly praise him. Now you might put the praise mask on. You know, it's easy to show outwardly. But you cannot honestly praise him if you're not truly trusting him. And if you're getting bitter at God or full of despair because you've let trials come into your into your life, then you're probably not trusting him. And my friend, you won't praise him. If you're a complainer or you know have trouble developing a habit of praise, then can I suggest the same two steps that were mentioned under uh, what we said about trust. First, concentrate on getting to know God in his ways. Uh, this psalm emphasises God's righteousness. We won't read the verses we have already probably in Psalm, uh, in verse 2, in verse 15, in verse 16, and 19, and, 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 and 24. Right, 24, my tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness. All right, so the psalm emphasizes God's righteousness. The psalmist was was fearing unjust treatment at the hands of unjust men, and and he wanted to affirm the righteousness of God, he uh, of the God that he trusted. In verse twenty again, he says, "Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles, shalt quicken me again, and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth." You know, he's good and faithful, even when he brings troubles and distresses into our lives. So concentrate on getting to know God and then second, review again what God has already done for you. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Isn't that the song we sing? You know, we, we tend to forget his many benefits on our behalf. All undeserved, totally unmerited, that grace that he has bestowed upon us. And as we forget those benefits, we then fail in praise. Do you have a habit of praise? Not only in the good times, but also in the times of trial. And then finally, the habit of hope. Habit of hope. Um, The psalmist had not only developed habits of trust and praise, but also finally of hope. Verse 14, but I will hope continually, continually. You know, we need to understand that there's a big difference between, of course, secular hope and biblical hope. Um, Both forms of hope contain the idea of future expectation. But secular hope, of course, is uncertain because uh, the object of that hope is uncertain. (laughs) Uh, Whereas biblical hope is sure because God is its object. All right, verse uh, 5, as the psalmist declares, you know, for thou art my hope, O Lord God. Who's the, uh, the, sub- the object, of course, is Lord, the Lord God. And uh, that is a sure hope. Now, again, just by way of a quick example, if I invested in the stock market, and I don't, all right, but uh, if I invested in the stock market and said, I hope that my investment will earn me 10%, 10%, hmm, uh, there is... There's uncertainty because the object of my hope, the stock market, right, of course, is unstable. But when I say I hope that Jesus Christ will return for his church, I'm expressing something certain but not yet realized. Thus, biblical hope is built upon trust in what? In God and his faithfulness. Believers should be people who have the habit of hope built on the promises of God. There's a story of a missionary who was suffering from a life-threatening fever and he was isolated and a friend sent him a letter asking him, how's the outlook? And the missionary simply replied, the outlook is as bright as the promises of God. The outlook is as bright as the promises of God. Unfortunately, though, many Christians have picked up the negative, hopeless spirit of the world because they are focused 
on the problems instead of God and his promises. Yeah, if you're developing that habit, it will make you bitter, not better, as you grow older. And God's people should be people who hope in God. Amen? Thus the psalmist was in good stead in his old age because he had developed a deep knowledge of God and he had developed the godly habits of trust, hope and praise. Now in conclusion, we'll just make a few comments. It says, uh, as uh, make a few comments here. It says, although the, the psalmist was old, all right, it's, this is revealed in verses uh, 9 and 18, uh, he could have kicked back and he could have said, I deserve some rest. But he didn't. He still had a concern for ministry. He still had a concern for testifying to others of God's faithfulness and power. Check it out in verse in verse 8. He says, Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honour all the day. Let thy mouth be filled with thy praise. Um, in verse uh, um, 15, uh, and following, my mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Um, o God, that hast taught me from my youth, and he, hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Okay, so his, his mouth is filled with uh, the praise. His mouth is showing forth his righteousness. He's declaring uh, his wondrous works. In verse 18, Now also when I am old and grey-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. You see his mindset here? He wasn't kicking back. He wanted to show this generation the power of God, the very power of God. Um, and so he went about ministering. You know, see, the, 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 psalm, the psalmist didn't want to be delivered from his problems so that he could go and play golf and uh, and go fishing every day. It's not bad, by the way. Uh, you know, if you can take someone fishing with you to minister to, <laughs> witness to, if you can play golf, if you can play golf, um, I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, you know, this psalmist wanted to be delivered so that he could proclaim God's power to the next generation. He had a vision to hand off the baton to the younger generation and he saw a longer life as an opportunity for extended ministry and his ministry was built on what it was built on his knowledge of god and his habits of trust praise and hope so he had something worth handling off didn't he well how about you how about you are you developing a lifestyle of ministry now built on your personal walk with God. I trust that you are. I trust that you are. It makes for a, a meaningful a meaningful old age. You know, if you've never sat down with Brother Derek and had a cup of tea and uh, and just allowed him just to share with you times past and how God has proven his greatness, then you need to. Uh, I love sitting with older Christians, I say that respectfully, um, who can testify of God's greatness. You know, <laughs> Brother Derek will testify there's never been a walk in the clouds, not always. Uh, there have been some tremendous trials and heartaches and, and situations that have been brought into his life. But praise God, his testimony stands firm. And I don't want to praise the man as such because I know he'll get embarrassed, but I do praise the Lord and it's an encouragement to be able to look to the older men in the church that have been through it, have been through those trials and, and tribulations, and yet they, their testimony is true, stands firm, and they're still praising God. Why? Because they have a right focus. They have a deep knowledge of God. And they've developed those habitual uh, habits of, of uh, trust and faith and uh, and hope. I have a few more examples, but we won't share uh, those for time tonight. But we just want to conclude by saying this. God's way for us to grow old 
I said this before at the start of the message. God's way for us to grow old is for us to develop a walk with him now. You know, a walk that involves a deep personal knowledge of God, a walk that includes the habits of trust, praise and hope, and a walk that involves a lifestyle of ministry to God. Then, as long as we have life and breath, we can show and tell and sing of the greatness of our God to the next generation. What a way to go. It's a wonderful psalm. I trust that you might read it continually <laughs> throughout the week and uh, trust that it will be a blessing to you. Let's come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for this psalm and for the encouragement that it is. Uh, may it cause us to realign our focus, Lord. Uh, may it cause us to look into our hearts and to see that we're uh, where we are with our standing with you. Uh, Father, help us to develop habitual habits of trust, praise, and hope. Help us, Lord, to gain that deep knowledge of our God, that, Lord, we may be struck in awe of your majesty, your power, your glory. Help us, Lord, to look back and to see how you've, what you've done for us already so much. Not, over, uh, not only enabling the, the, uh, the door of salvation to be swung widely open, the finished work of the cross of Calvary, but, Lord, that continual uh, walk with us as you guide us, as you deliver us, as you keep us safe, as you go before us. Lord, you know what's ahead. And Father, we could fear what's ahead. But I thank you, Lord, that we have a sure hope. That we have a, a sure hope. That we have a God who has who's shown us through his word in the past that he has been there for his people. That he has delivered his people. And that we have the promises in your word that you will do that again to those who have placed their faith and trust in you. So Lord, we pray that you would help Christians to gain a faith that is steadfast. Though that I, I, I fear, Lord, that that faith is going to be tested maybe before your return, for the sake of bringing people to their knees and for the sake of showing people their need of salvation. It may be at our peril. It may be, Lord, that we may suffer, be brought out of our comfort zone for the sake of the gospel. Lord, in those times, Help us again to put our faith and trust in you that that trust may bring about praise and the assurance of that blessed hope that for the Christian the best is yet to come. And Lord, help us to maintain that focus, to focus on the heavenly prize that you have promised us, made possible through your Son's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. How can we not be struck in awe? Father, may this truly have an impact on our lives and may it build us up. May it cause us to glorify you in all that we do and say. We thank you now in Jesus' name.